Okay, I say we get started. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody just to start. Um, thank you so much for being here. This is such a cool uh, and exciting movement uh, that we get to be a part of. Um, first, let me introduce myself. So my name is Megan McConlog. I am a product software engineer at, or excuse me, software manager um, at the Broad Institute in the data sciences platform. And uh, I am one of the co-ambassadors for the Women in Data Sciences for uh, the Broad Institute. So thank you all for coming. Just wanted to give a warm welcome and gratitude for you all being here. We're very excited for you to be here at this event. Um, so before we get started, uh, as this is a movement and we are a part of a greater organization, we would love for you to rep this event. Um, so if you have a Twitter and you are a tweeter, um, feel free to use this uh, hashtag and we would love the support. Um, and then for more of the administrative stuff, uh, we're doing the introductions now, so I wanted limited it because we have really awesome talks and I wanna jump into those. Um, so the three talks that we're actually gonna be going into are, are different, but all about a very similar and very important topic right now uh, that all relate to data science as well. So they're, they're different because they look and use data science in different ways, but because they're all about COVID research, we wanted to show it to you in three different ways, meaning um, we wanted to look at COVID in three different lenses, uh, first of which is the, the testing side. So how can we actually find out who has COVID or not. We have a talk about that and then we'll transition into more of actually understanding COVID itself and how it affects people. So then we'll have a talk about the epidemiology of the virus and then we'll close out with a population geneticist who's gonna tell us a bit about how it, it affects people differently um, and kind of how we can research that. Um, but before we get started about all of that, let me tell you a little bit about WIDS. So WIDS, or the Women in Data Science, is an organization that has 150 plus chapters and thousands of people who are involved. Um, it was started in Stanford and we are incredibly grateful to be a part of it um, and to be able to host these regional events. So uh, they are, oh, this is, this event is a regional event that coincides with their conference um, that happens once a year and it is meant to empower women. Um, but what better way than me talking about it than actually to watch an intro video about it. So uh, let's take the next kind of five minutes and listen to WIDS corporate telling us how, what their project is and how important it is. So let's jump to there. Data science and any data inspired and data driven science is so critical right now. More and more decisions are made based on data. The amount of data that we gather every day and the insights that the data can provide us is just growing exponentially and that is no exaggeration. The market for data science and related areas like AI is booming. It is so important to have women in artificial intelligence in the area of data science and also in leadership roles. It's being able to use data to solve issues and understand bigger problems, it's critical. And we need women in these roles. Every individual brings their own perspective, and so we need to make sure the entire workforce is represented. And the good news is there's so many jobs and many different ways to combine their passion area and their skills in data science and get involved. I would like you to say, what are the problems in the world that absolutely have to be changed? And, you know, can you individually, given all the amazing background that you've had so far and all the education that you've got so far, what are the unique things that you can do to change the world towards that mission? And then think of the technology. If that is going to become completely data driven over time, then you can't miss that opportunity. You've got to join in and 
and, and then have your say. If you're not looking at the data from all sorts of different angles, then you could introduce a lot of bias. So it's really, really important that we have around the table all genders, uh, all races, all backgrounds. We can't ignore social and structural problems. We can't just go in a, in a corner and write some code and read math and then we're open. That's, that's the solution, right? We can't do that. So we have to think about who is being affected by these algorithms. Welcome to WIN! <laughs> when we first started this conference, we never would have imagined that we'd be sitting here today with over 200 regional events. We've got over 500 WIS ambassadors worldwide. Many of them are women, but we've also got a lot of men. And these are people who are just passionate about inspiring others within their community. We are in over 60 countries, and year after year, we're blown away. Let's make this next decade, the women in the data science uh, decade. What I love about it is that that growth is viral. That people will attend one event in one city, and then they'll want to bring it to their cohort or colleagues the next year. This type of industry can be done everywhere, so it should be accessible to everybody. And this is one of the reasons why I love that we are global with this. So we wanted to create opportunities for women to inspire, educate, and support women at many different times throughout the year. And one way that we decided we could do that was through a data-thon every year, which is a predictive analytics challenge using real-world data. We have over 900 teams from 85 countries, and that's in every continent except Antarctica. When we started WITS in 2015, we had no idea this was going to be a global movement with tons of international events and a data-thon and a podcast show and, and now outreach to middle school and high school has just been such a ride. Our latest endeavor is to work on some materials that we can hand off to teachers in schools around the world. This has provided a platform for literally hundreds of women, if not thousands of women, to have an opportunity to be heard. But the truth is, these are really simple experiments, but they had profound impact because they empowered someone else to be able to do their job better and to be able to take that message. Five years ago, when we were sitting around a coffee table, thinking about what WIBS could be, I never in my wildest dreams thought it would grow so far and so wide around the world in just five years. What I'm most excited about is the next five years, because I think this is really just the start. All right. So with that, uh, I think that it's time for us to jump into our talks. Uh, I think that's why you're all here. That's why WIDS exists. So uh, before we jump in, because there's so many people, um, I, I think it's better for us to use um, a platform to actually ask our questions at the end. So each talk will go on for about 20 to 25 minutes, uh, and then that'll leave some time for questions. Um, so if you do have a question, go to sli.do and enter, enter 95126. We'll put it in the chat channel as well. Um, just so that you can find it later on. Uh, but if you have any questions, add those there to kind of keep the flow um, of it. So let's jump in. Our first speaker, uh, her name is Marissa Fisher. She is a software engineer in uh, the genomics platform at the Broad Institute. And before COVID-19, she was building tools um, to look at PRS, polygenic risk scoring, uh, and actually demonstrating those across uh, uh, it, as a part of IBM and Broad's collaboration. Uh, and because of COVID, and as you, some of you may know, the Broad Institute has actually transitioned to do um, thousands of COVID-19 tests, um, multiple thousand a day, and has actually done over a hundred thousand tests. Uh, Marissa will tell you more about it, but uh, it is this amazing, uh, work that the genomics platform has done. And in order to do that, they need someone to build the infrastructure. And that is where Marissa comes in. So Marissa, go ahead and thank you. All right. Um, so I think I need permission to share my screen here somehow. Uh, I 
will stop sharing. <coughs> and I will make you the host. Okay, cool. Thank oh, you. It seems like you can present. All right. Perfect. Oops. Oh, we should not be at the end. One second here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank you, Megan, for the introduction. It was cool to see that video, too, for the first time. I hadn't seen it, but I've listened to the Women in Data Science podcast a lot and recognized the voices of those um, two women who are the leaders of the program, so that's cool to see. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, my talk today is titled From the Basement to the Cloud, Creating the COVID-19 Reporting Pipeline. And I hope this story provides some insight into what it's like to build a system from the ground up and some of the challenges and decisions that one has to face under pressure and time constraints. And the story I'm gonna tell is you know, one way of doing things and of course there are many. So this all started on <clears throat> March 11th when my manager came to my desk and told me there was about a 50-50 chance that we would be standing up COVID testing in the GP lab and that they might need my help with reporting test results. Um, since we really didn't have any software in place to handle this, and not to mention we didn't have any you know, chemistry or lab process to do COVID testing in our lab either. Um, but this news came on the same day that the Broad announced that everyone was going to have to start working from home. So I was really excited and happy to be able to help in whatever way that I could, but I really had no idea um, what was, what was going to happen in the coming weeks, and now it's been a couple of months. Um, and little did I know that less than two weeks later, we would have a full-scale cloud-based pipeline running and producing clinical reports 24-7. Uh, so two days later, um, by March 13th, the GP leadership team had decided that this was really happening. So what did this mean for me on the informatics side? Um, for one, it meant that we were going to receive samples with patient data and we needed to securely store that data somewhere. So this asked for a database. Um, we would be running diagnostic tests in the lab on these samples and need to informatically determine their results, whether the samples are positive or negative for the virus. Um, so we needed to do some real time processing. And thirdly, we need to deliver report files to sites in a reliable and secure manner. So we needed some kind of secure file storage. Um, but first, before I go into writing any code, I had to figure out where was this system actually going to run? Um, and I considered three options. So one being um, on-premises resources, so servers that the Broad Institute owns and maintains. Um, and some of the pros of this was that I could have leveraged some of the existing LIMS um, infrastructure, and LIMS is laboratory information management system. So we have all that in GP since we do um, other types of tests um, and sequencing in our lab. So I could have possibly built in reporting into that platform and um, I knew that we had servers readily available for this. But some of the cons is that it's difficult to maintain and I, I really wasn't sure where to begin or who to ask or what servers to run things on. Um, so I wasn't super excited about that option. Um, secondly, I considered Amazon Web Services, otherwise known as AWS, which is um, a cloud-based offering. And some of the pros of this was that I was quite familiar with AWS from past experience. Um, and I knew there were a ton of resources to choose from and I could kind of envision like how I, how I could execute a system like this um, in AWS and their resources are <clears throat> ready out the box. A um, couple issues were though, the AWS is not really used widely at the Broad Institute. <clears throat> so billing and security would have been a bit more complicated. Um, and then thirdly, um, I considered the Google Cloud Platform, otherwise known as GCP. And Google has a well-established relationship with the Broad Institute. Uh, there are a lot of developers at the Broad who are familiar with GCP. There are many resources to choose from. Um, it's similar to AWS. And they're actually competitors in the cloud space. And Another thing I would get for free basically was um, the billing and security were taken care of. So we already had billing accounts set up um, for GCP within um, the genomics platform and it was approved by the InfoSec team. The only con really was that I had little experience with it, but um, given that I knew AWS pretty well, I figured it wouldn't be too much of a lift to get used to using GCP. 
Um, so I, I liked it in that sense and ended up going with GCP. Mm. Uh, the next thing was what language to use. And I pretend like this was a question, but honestly, it, I didn't think about it too much. I basically went straight for Python. Um, I was most familiar with it. I know there are a ton of resources online for Python. Uh, I knew it was going to be compatible with any GCP resources that we decide to use. And there's a lot of developers that know Python, um, especially within the Broad Institute as well. And ultimately, I didn't have a lot of time to make a decision. So in retrospect, though, choosing to use Python and GCP together really enabled other developers to quickly hop on this project too and help as it grew larger and larger. Mm. So breaking things down, it was clear that at minimum, we were going to need at least three scripts to do three distinct pieces of work to support COVID testing. Um, one was that we we're going to need to read and store incoming sample data. When we get samples, we we're going to receive things like patient names, sample barcodes, birth dates, ordering institution, and we'd need to later map back to those to be able to provide reports with this information on it. Um, secondly, we're going to need to have to evaluate plate results. So the actual um, test itself runs on a, a qPCR machine and those machines um, produce uh, CSV reports with a bunch of numbers. And so we would need a script to evaluate those results and decide if a sample is positive or negative for the virus. And thirdly, we're going to need to actually generate reports. So periodically to produce CSV and PDF reports that would get sent out to an institution. Um, and for to uh, run these scripts, I decided to use um, Google Cloud Functions. And Cloud Functions are basically a serverless resource you can use to deploy code. Um, they can be invoked directly by cloud storage buckets, PubSub messages, or HTTP, which was um, pretty a pretty nice feature. And all of the above um, pieces of work that needed to get completed are really event driven. You don't really need a server running these scripts 24 seven. They are more so react to events, do the work and then die. Um, so that's kind of how cloud functions work. And we started with these three for the core business logic, but I think we're now up to something like 15 cloud functions that handle things other than the core business logic, like Slack communications, um, reporting statistics to the Department of Public Health and emailing sites and build and error notifications. So um, anything you wanna do, you can deploy some code to a cloud function and make it happen. Um, and here's just an example of what uh, it looks like in the actual GCP user interface. So you write some Python code in your editor on your machine and you can deploy it to a cloud function along with any requirements it needs. So for example, for this cloud function, um, we also package with it a requirements.txt that gets installed upon deployment so that you can use any external Python libraries for your code as well. Um, but there still had to be a decision made on what kind of database we were going to use. Um, I only really considered Google BigQuery and Google Cloud SQL. I know there are more options in this even within um, the Google Cloud offering. Um, but in terms of BigQuery, it's super fast for querying. It's known to be fast and it's also ideal for big data. You also pay by usage um, and it's, it's more geared toward insert operations as updates are limited. I think you have a quota of, I'm not sure the amount per day of how many updates you can actually do um, to a BigQuery table. And, um, oops. Um, However, though I wasn't super familiar with BigQuery, so I played around with it a bit, but ultimately I ended up going with Cloud SQL. It's your standard um, relational database. You can use a flexible query language like Postgres or MySQL. Um, you pay by storage, so you set what you need or what you think you might need. Um, you've got unlimited querying, and additionally I was already quite familiar with Postgres. Um, I also didn't anticipate us uh, storing terabytes of data. And the other big deterrent of BigQuery was that we needed to, we needed read and write capability without limitation. So the choice was SQL. And I think it was a good bet. Currently, after two months of processing samples, we have less than half a gigabyte of data in the database. So in reflection, BigQuery was definitely not necessary. 
Um, but there's still the question of how do we actually receive uh, patient data and how do we transfer reports back to hospitals and nursing homes. Um, so for this, um, we set up Google Cloud storage buckets. So they fall within the GCP security boundary. Um, they can trigger cloud functions. So for example, if you drop a CSV file in a cloud storage bucket, you can have a cloud function kick off a script that runs your Python code. Um, they can be exposed to the outside world though, however, um, with certain permissions. So certain hospitals that use G Suite or have a Gmail account could be added to have permission to the bucket and pull their um, reports from the bucket directly. Uh, additionally, it allows for like object listing and folder structure. So it's kind of like a USB in the cloud or your Max finder in the cloud. So by March 19th, this was the first pass at the architecture. Um, a little over a week after all this started, um, this is kind of where we landed. So everything within the box is within the GCP security boundary. And I had some help from the InfoSec team to make sure that, you know, this was going to be a secure system. Um, and the process really starts when we receive a box of samples. And the box of samples is accompanied um, with an electronic manifest usually. So in the lab, they receive the box, they upload the um, electronic manifest, and then the data gets um, processed with a, a read and store cloud function, which then puts data into our Cloud SQL database so that it can be referenced later for reporting. Um, shortly after the samples start going through the actual lab process, um, this takes about three hours, including about 90 minutes on the qPCR machines that do the actual test for the virus. And then um, we receive an output CSV report with a bunch of numbers that need to be evaluated. So that's uploaded to another storage bucket kicks off a cloud function, which parses all of the data in there and determines the results and again stores the results in our SQL database. Um, then from there, you, you've got results basically ready to be reported. So at the beginning, we were running a cloud scheduler every hour on the hour to produce um, CSV and PDF reports. Um, and those are then reviewed by our clinical supervisors and delivered to sites. So at the beginning, um, the ingest and delivery of data um, had to have some manual work done still as we had only a few sites at the beginning. So this is an example of what a CSV report looks like, pretty standard. And of course this is fake data. Um, but it's, it's nice to standardize on CSV because some of the hospitals we work with are informatically processing the results that we send them as well. And this is an example of what a PDF report looks like. Um, so it's actually generated via a Python library that converts HTML to PDF. Um, so it's really just your standard HTML and CSS and thousands of these are generated per day and packaged up into zip files and delivered to sites. However, before we fully went to production, um, this was, I think, the weekend of March 21st or something, um, we needed a way to actually allow our clinical supervisors to review results and reports. I mean, this was clinical after all, so we couldn't just automate everything. Um, so it turns out you can actually hook up cloud functions to post to a Slack channel with webhooks. Um, so anytime a plate was ready for review, um, the one of the cloud functions would post a success message to a Slack channel with a link to the file itself. So supervisors could click on this file, review the CSV, and then once they think that everything looks okay, um, they put a check mark so we know that um, it has been reviewed. And then additionally, um, when the final reports, like the PDFs are ready, uh, we post as well in the Slack channel and say the final results for such and such site is available here. Um, the supervisor again reviews the final reports just to make sure that the numbers line up kind of thing. And um, they put a check mark after it's been reviewed and delivered. So this was ready to go on March 23rd. Um, 
And by this time, there was a team forming. So we, with more hands, we were able to automate more and more things. So um, two months into, into it now, I guess, uh, the core has not really changed, but we've added some additional cloud functions to help automate things um, and make the whole process more streamlined and much better. Um, so for example, we added a cloud function to receive manifests from sites who um, expose their servers to us so that we can pull them in directly. And we have Slack notifications around that anytime we receive a new manifest. Um, additionally, we added Slack integrations for notifying whenever we receive bad data, we post in Slack to say, hey, uh, someone in the lab has uploaded a manifest that's missing data, we need to re-upload this. Um, and then also, as I showed in the last slide, a couple of Slack notifications if, if um, a plate was successful or failed, and Slack, Slack uh, notifications for when final reports are ready. And then we also added a send report cloud function that um, handles things like email delivery and, po and posting results to external servers. Um, so as we figured out what gaps needed to be filled, we made improvements over time to minimize manual steps. And here are a couple examples of what the Slack integrations look like for those two additional features. So when we receive new manifests, we, have a, we provide a link to the manifests. And um, when we deliver reports, we also give a notification internally to say, hey, we delivered these reports to this location and we notified such and such email. Um, so it just adds a lot of visibility to know what's going on and better for tracking to make sure that everything is taken care of end to end. And through all of this, um, we really relied heavily on GitHub, Slack, and Google Cloud. Um, within GitHub, we use GitHub Actions. So we require all of our unit tests to pass before we merge to any environment. And we've incorporated um, Slack with GitHub as well so that we receive things like build notifications, error notifications, anytime we open a pull request or do a production release, um, we track that in Slack as well. Um, and then organizing our resources by project has been really helpful. So kind of following the standard continuous integration, continuous delivery workflow from development branch within GitHub to staging to master branch, which um, is always aligned with what we have in production. So that's been, um, that's really allowed us to stay organized and um, share code and work on code uh, at the same time. So breaking things down, um, here's just a few numbers. Our original plan was to hit a thousand tests per day. Um, since March 25th, the daily average is over 2000 tests per day. I checked a couple days ago could be higher now. Um, and our highest day was May 16th with over 5,000 tests completed. And on May 14th, we completed our 100,000th test. And just to put that in perspective, we only hit 50,000 on April 27th. So a little over a month after everything actually started and we got our validation from the FDA and um, actually started doing clinical tests. And then it was only about to a little over two weeks later that we hit 100,000. So you can see some exponential growth happening there. Um, we started with only two qPCR machines in our lab. We now have nine machines running 24 seven and there are up to 93 samples per experiment that come off um, in 90 minute intervals. And we deliver all of our results to over 400 sites across New England, including um, hospitals, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, um, and some uh, industry partners as well, like MIT. Um, so scaling up, uh, you can see over time, we have increased the amount of tests that we've done um, with a couple low days around Easter and Mother's Day. Um, all this data is uh, publicly available at this URL if anyone is interested to check it out. Um, but I wanna emphasize what really enabled us to scale and say also that you know the system that exists now is much better than the system that existed on launch on March 23rd. The core is really the same but continuing to improve the system to increase automation and reduce manual steps really allowed us to scale 
and using things like cloud functions, storage buckets, using cloud build for deployment and really just iterative automation. Um, so with this, of course, there were a lot of challenges. Um, some that stand out first, they're working with many sites, you know, over 400 sites, there are many different requirements that each of them have. And it's difficult to find a one size fits all workflow for everyone. Each site had different requirements and juggling these was difficult, especially at the beginning. Some wanted their results sent directly to their server via SFTP. Some were fine with pulling from our Google buckets with the right permissions. Some even wanted their results via fax. Um, so this really can limit scale without a one size fits all solution. And at the beginning, things were also moving faster than requirements could be set. And this definitely caused some headaches later on. So for example, things like sample tracking and analytics were definitely not as good as they could have been with some more careful planning upfront with things like the database schema. Um, project management turned out also to be a serious need as the project scaled. So tracking feature requests in GitHub and having a project board really made a big difference for us. Um, and of course, striking a balance of speed and development and due process. At first, it was just like, go, 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 as fast as you can, let's you know make this happen. But once things hit production and stabilize, you need solid documentation, you need to do testing, you need code reviews, and you need to plan for failure scenarios. Um, and these are all standard procedures that need to happen for a CLIA test, especially when handling clinical results for a deadly virus. And additionally, this has been a huge learning experience. Um, some things that stand out that stood out to me in reflection was one uh, technical aspect being the use of Slack bots. I had seen them used before um, by other colleagues, but I hadn't really played around with them myself and just how easy it was. Um, it was really cool and seeing how that all gets set up. And the fact that we don't have any UI for this whole system, the lab personnel actually just interact with Slack bots and Google buckets. Um, Additionally, uh, learning how to run a system in a, in a CI CD manner um, with GCP. So for this, we use a tool called Cloud Build, which is a pretty awesome resource. It's essentially a config file that can run shell scripts, tests, uh, deploy resources, and set things like environment variables. Um, and I also realized that processes really do work. So in, um, ensuring that things like code reviews happen, following a flow where you merge your code from develop to staging to master branches, using a CI CD workflow and making sure you have good documentation. I think all of the above have been extremely valuable ensuring that we deploy good code and that everything goes through the proper review and testing and that new people can also be onboarded easily to work on the project. And finally, uh, building an engineering team out of nothing and figuring out people's strengths and working together to let us each do what we do best and doing all of this remotely. I've yet to actually meet um, my teammates in person that I've worked with day and night over the last two months, which is pretty interesting. Um, and with that, the COVID-19 pipeline engineering team was born. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Chris, Lucas, and Dave who continue to volunteer countless hours, including nights and weekends because COVID does not stop on weekends. Um, and just want to say, you know, the system would be nowhere near what it is today without the massive contributions from these guys as well. And I'm thankful that they were able to help um, GP and hop on this project. And also thankful to many others who have contributed, like the DSP field engineering team, the InfoSec team, and the LIMS team within GP. And ultimately, I think I realized that we have some really amazing people at the Broad Institute who have stepped up during these challenging times. And I'm super amazed with everyone in GP and beyond for how we banded together to make this a reality. Um, so with that, I just want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to share this story today. And um, if anyone wants to reach out uh, on careers in software engineering, um, whether it's in the medical field or otherwise, um, I'm happy to connect with you and you can reach out to me on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. And I think we have some time now for questions. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I don't know if you guys want to do the clap thing in <laughs> Zoom, but please feel free to do that. Um, this was so interesting. So thank you so much for showing us not only the technical detail of it, but the results. I think that's a very cool thing to see both uh, 
rather than kind of just saying, oh, this is how many we did. And it, you know, some decisions were made. We got to see the detail. I really appreciate that. Uh, there are a couple questions that we've gotten thus far. Um, we only have time for a couple, so we'll kind of cut it off there. Uh, so the first one is, uh, what was the most challenging aspect of getting the FDA validation? Um, hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question, um, but I think just the timing that everything needed to happen um, basically, we decided, I think, yeah, it was March 13th that we were going to do this. So um, I know Niall went in, my, my manager, and Stacey Gabriel and Sheila, um, GP management, worked really hard to make this happen quickly. Um, and I think, additionally, that FDA gave some leeway, I think, to allow labs like ours to make it happen faster. But yeah, there are, of course, um, implications in the lab of, I, I mean, that's a whole other story that can be told of how they actually pull things together on the lab side and how they do the actual extraction and qPCR tests. Um, the chemistry on that also had to happen very quickly, and it's pretty impressive how they did so in, a, um, in the manner that they did. Awesome. And then just one more question here, uh, just because there are others, but we're running out of time on this. Uh, but there will be time at the end, especially for mentor-based questions, uh, if you're interested in a career in software, to hold and stay for the last 30 minutes of it from 3 to 3.30. So the last question here um, is, what do you do with the personal data after the test results are delivered? Um, was there ever a consent form? Kind of how did you go through that process? Um, yeah, so as a CLIA lab, we are required to store that patient data when we receive it. Um, so this was, you know, a big question at the beginning of all this. Well, oh, can we just use barcodes and, you know, identify it back that way? But um, if we receive it, we do have to store it. So we, um, we keep it in our database. Awesome. I guess I'll ask one more because we have one more minute. <laughs> um, so Amanda said, so cool. Uh, this sounds like uh, this was a very fast process with a steep learning curve. Is there something you would have wished um, were set up before? Skills, platforms, anything like that? Um, well, hmm. yeah, in a way, I mean, yeah, it would have been nicer if uh, maybe I had more time to make certain decisions at the beginning. Like, I think one thing that we struggled with later on was like analytics. Um, because, you know, we do want to do the full circle and make sure that every sample we receive is reported on properly. Um, and I think I had to make a lot of decisions early on, like even things like the database schema, like what is going to be the name of this column? What's going to be the type of this field in the database? Like these are things that I had to decide very quickly. And I think um, it would have been better to, maybe work with the analytics team more closely to figure out the best situation for everyone involved. Um, but I think looking back, it's it's turned out all right. <laughs> As we can see from the numbers. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Uh, Marissa, thank you so much. Uh, again, I don't know if you guys want to do the clapping. <laughs> Sorry. We can just virtually <laughs> clap. Uh, all right. So next up, we have Katie Siddle. Katie is a postdoc um, at, uh, at Harvard and at the Broad Institute. Um, her, before COVID, her work actually looked pretty similar. Um, so she does uh, viral epidemiology. Um, so she's well suited to do research on this. Um, Katie's postdoctoral uh, post work focuses on the development and implementation of genomic tools for the surveillance of emerging infectious diseases. Um, currently, Katie is, you know, with COVID, is actually researching the epidemiology of coronavirus to track the virus itself and to kind of track the outbreak and how it has emerged and how it has adapted. Um, so, Katie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and if you want to steal the screen share, uh, I think, Marissa, you'll have to stop sharing in order to jump over. Sorry, just a second here. There we go. Thank you. Um, 
my slides also appear to be starting at the end. <laughs> um. Okay, are those showing up in full full screen mode? Uh, not full full screen. We can see the slide count. Ah, okay. Okay. Are better? Yep. All right. Great. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, for today and for me. Um, this is really exciting to get to talk a bit about some of the work we've been doing. So, um, yeah, as I already mentioned, I'm a postdoc in uh, Padi Savetti's lab. We, uh, or at least a, a good chunk of a good chunk of us, work uh, in the viral genomics space generally, um, particularly developing experimental and computational tools for um, uh, investigating um, uh, viral genomes and understanding kind of epidemiology of outbreaks. Um, so this is work that the lab got deeply involved with really starting kind of around the time of the Ebola outbreak um, and we've been kind of deeply involved in ever since in a number of different uh, in a number of different contexts. Um, sort of a number of these projects are focused uh, abroad, but also um, we've kind of through this developed really deep partnerships with a number of the local hospitals, particularly Mass General Hospital, um, as well as the Department of Public Health in the state um, and others. And so when um, coronavirus uh, was emerging, um, it was kind of a natural thing that we would uh, really buy these kind of skills and these tools that we have built uh, to try to understand a little about uh, how this outbreak was, was developing um, kind of close to home. Um, and so that's what we did. And so for the last nine weeks, um, that's what we've been doing. It's been shut down. A small group of people have been in the lab uh, and a much larger group have been analyzing and thinking together and discussing kind of all this in. Um, and so I wanted to share with you today. Okay, so this is a story that needs no introduction, of course, but um, as is by now well aware, this all started, um, you know, as or what we now commonly and are very familiar with as SARS-CoV-2 began as an unknown uh, pneumonia back in December 2019. Um, and really, it was the sequencing of uh, a few genomes by some Chinese scientists in January 2020 allowed us to put a name to what this was. Uh, and to start to understand something about what we were seeing, so what was then called 2019 NGOV became SARS-2 later. And we were able to see for the first time kind of what this virus looked like, but that it was a virus, that it was in fact a positive sense RNA virus uh, with a genome of about 30,000 nucleotides. Um, and it told us already like a ton of other information about what this was. Um, so this, I'm just showing a tree here uh, of those first few genomes um, up, uh, in, in blue here, sorry, I think the coronavirus Wuhan. Um, and, you know, and so this was kind of where people first started to be able to infer how this may have emerged, um, uh, characterized the kind of, uh, this sort of came up, the idea that this was most likely coming uh, from, from bats, although that has been challenged with a lot of discussion there. Um, and that's a, a debate I won't get into, but again, I just wanna use this as a way to illustrate that kind of having these genomes gave us, you know, even just a few genomes gave us some really critical information. And as this has gone on, we've had a lot more genomes and we'll say a lot more about what we're seeing. So this is kind of a bigger question. What can we learn from viral genomes? And I apologize if this is redundant. I wasn't sure kind of uh, who would be here today and what people were familiar with. So I apologize if this, if this goes, a little, goes a little slow, but really um, you know, there's a lot of different things we can learn from viral genomes in terms of uh, the identity of something, it's epidemiology, biology and function, mutation, how something might be changing or potentially adapting. It was also having these genomes that allowed us to actually develop some of these diagnostics like the qPCRs that Marissa was talking about um, because by having that sequence, we could actually pick out pieces uh, of the genome to use for testing and for targeting. And the main tool that we use, so most of what I'm gonna talk about focuses really on the second point on epidemiology. And the main tool that we use here is phylogenetics. So broadly, the study of evolutionary relationships between organisms. And this is really powerful for letting us see how things relate to each other, how uh, either strains or species relate. 
um, and becomes even more powerful with tools that allow us to put this on an axis of time. Uh, so we can start to say not only how do two things relate to each other, but when do we think certain events were occurring and certain things were happening. I just wanted to illustrate this point with a couple of examples from some other work that the lab has done. Uh, in terms of how we can infer things such as introduction, when a virus might have arrived somewhere, and also how it might be being transmitted or spread. So these are two examples from Ebola virus. Here on the left, you have an example of how we can look at introduction. So these are genomes that came from Sierra Leone and from Guinea during the Ebola virus outbreak. And you can see that the Sierra Leone ones all kind of cluster here. And by dating the time of this branch point, we could infer kind of when the outbreak sort of arrived in Sierra Leone and when this kind of started. On a much more granular level, we can compare these viral genomes. If we know kind of epidemiology and contact between people, we can also use it as a way to potentially even perform kind of uh, genomic contact tracing. Um, and this is an example from a small outbreak of Ebola that was in Nigeria, where um, we put together genomes and transmission information to be able to say kind of uh, exact how, um, who may have come into contact with whom and how infection may have spread. Um, yeah. Another big piece of this from the data perspective in the context of viral genomics is that really sort of from the Ebola outbreak onwards, there's been a growing movement towards open data sharing in the context of outbreaks. Um, and this is a statement that came from the World Health Organization in 2015, that pathogen genetic sequence uh, and associated data is of the greatest value if made available uh, as close to real time as possible. And I think this was, you know, this was a statement they put out after Ebola and a, and a trend that's been emerging. And I think one of the most phenomenal things from a viral genomics perspective in this COVID outbreak is really how we've seen that kind of come to fruition. Um, the speed at which people have been uh, sharing publicly viral sequence data, um, sometimes in an order of hours from when a sample is received. Um, a lot of that information has been shared in a repository called GISTAID. Um, this is a, a screenshot I took from GISAID this morning. And so right now they have uh, over 30,000 uh, coronavirus genomes um, from all over the world available in that database. Um, GenBank currently has fewer submissions, but that is growing. Um, GISAID has some, uh, some ac like stricter access requirements, um, but it, has, it does have easier submission requirements, which is why it's been like the dominant uh, player. Um, but it's really just a colossal amount of information and sort of, you know, numbers of viral sequences on the scale we haven't really seen for an outbreak before. There are also a number of other tools that have been really um, influential in how the kind of field in the community is thinking about this outbreak and able to analyze and share uh, data. One that I wanted to mention that many may have heard of is something called Next Strain. Uh, and so next year, I think really illustrates the power um, of these kind of open source tools to allow kind of fast data sharing. So not only is the data there, but there are also now tools to kind of quickly look at and analyze this information. Um, and so I, I put the link there. If anyone hasn't explored next year and is interested in viral genomes, um, this is a really uh, fantastic resource that collates um, sort of a lot of this data from GISAID and, and uses it to build phylogenetic trees uh, and draw kind of maps um, to recapitulate how the outbreak uh, is, is kind of inferred to have been spreading. Um, so there really is like an enormous number of different tools available um, to analyze this data and a huge amount of data out there. Uh, and that's kind of what uh, we have been building on with some of the uh, data that we've been generating at the Broad. Just a quick word on the kind of global view of SARS-CoV-2 genomes. So this is uh, that figure I had just before from next strain colored by country. So you can see, um, I'm sorry, the country axis hasn't shown up here, but um, there are a lot of different genomes coming from really across the world. We're seeing from a lot from Europe, uh, particularly the UK, from Australia, um, uh, and from and increasingly from North America, uh, particularly from from Seattle, uh, which is doing a lot of sequencing and, and other kind of uh, cities. Um, people are starting to kind of give names to these clades and start to kind of develop nomenclature for structures, which is another kind of uh, challenge in this field. It's a new virus. We don't have a lot of this terminology, and this is kind of emerging as we as we go. Okay, so what about Massachusetts? Um, so these were our main questions when we started on this. So how and when was the virus introduced into the states? How has transmission been sustained? And what's the impact of different epidemiological settings on virus spread and how does that kind of make us think about uh, the future? 
So as I said at the beginning, this is a close partnership with Mass General Hospital and the Massachusetts DPH. Uh, the majority of the samples that we've had so far have been from, the, from Mass General Hospital. Um, and these were samples collected there and sent to the Brain Institute for Sequencing. And I think, um, I mean, if, if you come away from this with one thing, it's that like, this is an enormous team effort. I am like one of a huge army of people who've been working in this, both people in the lab and on the analysis side and on clinicians and epidemiologists. And I think this is the sort of project where data science really fits as like a key, um, a key piece of a very large puzzle. Um, and that has been like a huge pleasure to be part of, to kind of learn from all these different people and, 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 and hear from all these different perspectives. So for those who are less familiar with um, viral genomes and sequencing, I wanted to say a little bit about how we actually get these genomes. So how we kind of get from a sample in a tube to these beautiful trees. Um, so most of what we have at the moment is coming from uh, nasal swabs in buffer, which is the typical kind of sample that is being collected for diagnostic purposes. We extract RNA from these samples since this is an RNA virus. We convert the RNA into DNA and we make sequencing libraries from, these, uh, from this DNA. This whole process takes for us around two to three days. Uh, and here are some pictures of the folks uh, at the Broad who've been doing a lot of this work. So we've had um, people working in, in shift patterns. Um, we're not production level facilities, so we're you know, on a smaller scale, but we have really kind of scaled up our capacities over this time. And that's been in and of itself a kind of interesting logistical uh, project. Um, in total, we have now 1,001 samples prepared and submitted for sequencing. Um, not all of them are now or have been analyzed yet, but um, that's kind of where we, where we stand. As to what we have to do after that, so there's really two key pieces. So I spoke a little bit about these phylogenetic trees and the fact that that's kind of our main sort of mode of interpretation. To get there, we then take these samples and in our case, we're really preparing sequencing from everything in a sample. We're not, uh, a lot of methods that are being done on viral genomes at the moment is selecting just for SARS-CoV-2 and sequencing only the virus. We chose to take a different approach and do something called metagenomics. So we sequence all the genetic material in a sample um, in short fragments as like is shown here. Um, and so from those fragments, we then have to pick out the pieces that we need and reconstruct the viral genome. So we remove all the human sequence and assemble um, a viral genome from that. Um, and the main challenge here is not so much in the size of the data, more in the need to do this many times in parallel. So for anyone who's used to working with human genomes, viral genomes are teeny tiny, um, but uh, it's more about kind of the number of iterations that we're doing on this and the number of samples kind of doing in parallel. Uh, we've been doing uh, a lot of this work, and when I say me, this has primarily been Danny Park, Christine Lorath from the Data Science Platform and others. Um, in Terra. So for those who aren't familiar with Terra, Terra is a cloud native platform um, that was developed uh, in collaboration between the Broad and Verily. It runs on the Google Cloud platform currently. Um, very early on in the outbreak, the Broad shared a public, workspa a public workspace to share data and tools around COVID-19. Uh, and these were workflows developed by Danny Park, uh, who's part of Padista's uh, group, um, that have been built over years for these other viral outbreaks and that we were using for, for COVID. I put the link to that workspace, uh, workspace here. This is sort of a summary of the primary analysis workflow that we're using for SARS-CoV-2. So um, a lot of what we've done in the past was de novo assembly of viral genomes. Actually, what we and many others have found is that for SARS-CoV-2, reference-based assembly works better. Um, this is... Uh, perfectly feasible with SARS-CoV-2 because it's not currently, there's not a lot of genetic diversity in the virus. So whereas de novo assembly is really um, advantageous when you're dealing with genetically highly diverse viruses like Lassa virus, which is what our lab has worked a lot on, um, we're mainly doing a reference-based assembly for this one. And so that's kind of highlighted here where we basically use a sort of four-step approach of mapping our sequence reads to a reference genome. That's typically the kind of NCBI reference genome. Uh, scaffolding the genome from that, uh, doing some trimming of primer sequences and other low quality regions, um, and a refined step of that assembly. And this is part of a larger pipeline or workflow that is in Terra um, that brings in not only our data, but also publicly available data. Um, 
and performs this viral assembly as well as some uh, metagenomic analyses to classify other potential um, pathogens that may be in these samples. Um, and take these assemblies and build uh, these auger trees, the sort of uh, visualizations that I showed earlier. Um, so just a quick word on why we're using Terra. So I think this is, we're using Terra for the same, for the, really the reasons that Terra was built uh, and uh, is that it's scalable uh, in terms of storage and resources. Particularly in this case, it's easy to share data and tools uh, in a secure way. And the security is, as as um, uh, was mentioned before, is like a really big part of this, um, to perform reproducible, reproducible analyses in parallel, uh, and ultimately to allow other people to interact with this data, uh, to integrate their own data and uh, sh share and run analyses in a way that's kind of collaborative and, and centralized. So just a quick word on what we're seeing. So as I mentioned, we sequenced a thousand and well, we've prepared and sequenced a thousand and one samples so far. Um, we have uh, genomes assembled from a, from a portion of those um, and are starting to kind of see some, you know, make, develop some kind of insights into what we're seeing. Um, this is a full tree shown uh, in the same format of what I showed you before. So we have time here along the y-axis. This is a time, uh, a time rooted tree. Uh, and here we have sort of different colorings of samples. Um, Massachusetts in this case is in gray. And so it may not be terribly easy to see. But I think the overall view is that, you know, we're seeing um, uh, viral genomes in Massachusetts that cluster in different parts of this tree, consistent with having been, uh, uh, having sort of arrived independently um, and sort of subsequent infections and transmission within the state after, after that time. Um, and so we have, it's, sorry, it's not so easy to see, but yeah, so there's sort of gray kind of scattered throughout, largely in this uh, upper part of the tree, which is where you see a lot of samples from Europe as well, uh, and elsewhere in North America, uh, less, uh, fewer Massachusetts genomes, although there are some uh, kind of clustering down here with samples from uh, Asia and blue. Just a couple of uh, other smaller epidemiological insights that I wanted to highlight are the kind of uh, information that we can get out of this sort of data, which is uh, potentially relevant to public health. Uh, the first is, so um, the first uh, case from Massachusetts that was confirmed in late January, this was actually sequenced by the CDC. So as of present, we don't have any se uh, sequences in our data set uh, that cluster with that sample which is suggestive that kind of the extensive contract tracing efforts that went around this uh, were potentially uh, successful and we don't see evidence in our data of ongoing transmission from this introduction. And so this kind of, uh, I think, as you know, speaks to uh, hopefully the kind of importance and success of this kind of contact tracing efforts. I think a, an, an alternative example to this, which we see in some of our data, uh, is the what we've seen and heard in the news in many cases is that the, the real potential for the virus, on the other hand, to spread rapidly um, without these sorts of efforts. So this is a subset of that tree uh, from a residential facility where there was unfortunately a large number of positive cases with rapid spread. And we can see that this was rapid by the dates and also by the fact that genomes are identical in many cases. Um, and so these sorts of examples really speak to, um, to you know, how, how how rapidly this virus is is transmissible um, and and the sort of caution that we're all taking and we, everyone's thinking about kind of as we as we move to reopen. Another piece of actionable public health information is that we've been reporting this rapidly back to our partners at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Here I'm showing one example of an infection control question around two uh, COVID patients where it was unclear if the uh, infection was acquired uh, uh, if the infection was sort of transmitted one from the other or if these were independent. And by putting this on our tree, by sequencing these genomes and comparing to everything else, they, these two genomes from these viruses were very distinct, which suggests that this was not a case of transmission between these two patients. And so this is uh, the sorts of kind of more fine grained than these population level inferences, but the kind of detailed, maybe more actionable inferences that we can also make from this data. So we'll be sharing this information very soon in a new public workspace that's coming on Terra. Um, as well as our data, uh, we'll also be sharing all of our workflows uh, and uh, pipelines to make um, these assemblies, to prepare these sorts of trees if anyone has their own data, and also to submit this information to GenBank. 
I just wanted to flag a couple of other kind of data challenges that we've encountered along the way. Um, as was already mentioned, uh, secure storage and handling of metadata across institutions is a major challenge in terms of protection and confidentiality. Um, identifying genomes from the same individuals. So because so much sequencing has been going on, there are cases where maybe multiple institutions have sequenced the same patient sample. And thinking of kind of nomenclature for identifying this in data is a big uh, area of, of discussion. Also quantifying undersampling or biases in the data set. So as the outbreak progressed and more cases uh, occurred, uh, you know, the data that we have represents only a small portion of all the cases in Massachusetts and thinking about how that influences our conclusions and our inferences. And also, as I said earlier, this is really a case of like unprecedented numbers of viral genomes um, that are kind of computationally um, difficult to deal with, with many of the tools that we have. And so thinking about best practices for selecting subsets of this data or how much data is the right amount of data. How much, uh, how many uh, genomes do we need to be considering? How much data do we need to be taking into account to make sure our inferences and our conclusions are correct? And I think this is a big, uh, a big thing also. So where we're going with this, so we're gonna keep, uh, keep this work going uh, with our partners and with new partners who are coming, coming on and thinking about how we can use this to identify potential flare-ups or contact tracing uh, as the outbreak wanes in Massachusetts, but maybe we get kind of new cases uh, flaring up. Also thinking towards looking at how viral variants may be associated with severity of disease and potentially kind of next full differential diagnosis with SARS-CoV-2 and other pathogens um, as this continues. As I mentioned earlier, and I can't say this enough, this is a huge effort of many, many people, uh, both at the Broad, within the Sabeti lab, uh, particularly Jacob Lemieux and uh, Bronwyn and Danny, as well as the data science platform, Christine, uh, Sushma and others who've been completely invaluable in getting all of this onto terror and performing these analyses at scale and, and quickly and reproducibly, which is uh, completely essential for this, um, as well as all of our partners at Mass General Hospital, who've just been incredible kind of collaborators, thought partners on all of this from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and many others who I'm sure I've missed off here, uh, as well as support from, from a lot of funders. So yeah, so with that, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or, or later. That was wonderful. I can see people already catching on with the class. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, there are a couple questions already. Um, if people want to ask other questions, please feel free to jump into that Slido um, and ask your questions. So the first question that we have um, is what assembler, I think this is someone that does virology research as well, because I don't personally follow it, which is what assembler did you use to generate uh, COVE-2 assemblies? So I believe, and if Christine is here, she can jump in and, and correct me on this. Um, I think uh, a lot of it is happening in, well, the aligner is certainly happening with Novo line. I'm not exactly sure which aligner they're using currently. Uh, which assembler, sorry, is using currently. I believe it's being done with Nova Line uh, for the most part. Christine, do you have anything to add? Uh, yep, that's correct. It is Nova Line. Phew. <laughs> awesome. Okay, and then the, the other question here uh, is uh, interested to hear more on the challenges of the sheer number of genomes you process. Uh, what kind of infrastructure do you use for that and has it worked well? Um, from the experimental side or the computational side? I, I suppose I could, could answer both just in case. Um, I say both. So I think um, actually a, a number of the, of the things that were, uh, that Marissa raised already um, also sort of apply to us. And so um, kind of those connection points between the wet lab and the uh, analysis side, um, in terms of sharing data and ensuring things are, are consistent and reproducible is, is a piece that we really had to kind of build in this case, um, partly by virtue of the scale of this and partly by virtue of being remote for the first time, really, that we weren't allowed to kind of be in the same space, weren't able to be in the same space. Um, on the wet lab side, we've uh, built some more automation than we ever had before, which has been exciting. So we've used a lot more kind of liquid handling and, and robots within our lab to, to smooth that. Um, and on the an analysis side, I think in terms of scaling, it's really been sort of the transition to, to terror that has allowed us to kind of do this uh, in a bigger scale with, with more resources. Um, but yeah, 
I don't know, does that answer the question or were there other aspects? I think so, that, that was it. Um, so the next, we'll do a couple more, uh, which is first, is it, is it easy to add new software slash packages on Terra? Um, I believe so. My understanding is that um, so you can kind of clone your own workspace and so then you would have the sort of packages that we've been using and then if you have other uh, whittles uh, written you could incorporate those and analyze data that way. You can you can create a custom docker and in your whittle you can have um, you can specify to use that docker so if that docker has whatever packages you need then you can access it that way. Thank you. Uh, and then one other question here is, uh, I, may, I may have missed it, but does this have implications for immunity, whether from the vaccine or a previous infection um, as the viral genome changes? Um, so we can't really say anything about uh, immunity from the viral genomes. Um, I think we're only just uh, starting to look into this. There have been other reports uh, from other data generated about kind of certain mutations that people are particularly uh, concerned about. Uh, so one is the a mutation in the spike protein, which is the um, sort of uh, surface protein of the virus that allows it to sort of get into cells, um, and a, a mutation that's been identified there that people are uh, thinking about whether this may have implications for severity of disease or, or other things. So certainly this information, as we identify kind of changes that are happening, um, the genomic information can highlight these changes. There are computational tools to infer and predict whether we think a change may be functionally important or not. And then many other people who are following this up with experiments to actually functionally characterize and investigate mutations that are seen in these genomes, uh, whether they are sort of biologically uh, significant. Very cool. Uh, and then the last question here is, uh, are all of the 1001 samples sequenced so far from Massachusetts or are they kind of from around? Other so, um, yeah, so all of them were um, uh, samples collected by uh, Massachusetts uh, General Hospital um, and some also from the Department of Public Health. Uh, the vast majority are from Massachusetts. Um, I don't know the exact numbers. There may be a small number who um, were from out of, uh, out of the state. Um, but it, uh, they were um, samples collected in, in, in Massachusetts by the, yeah, primarily by MGH. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Again, if we want to do a quick thank clap, you, uh, this was really great. Um, and so we really appreciate you being here. Um, I skip to the next slide. Yes. Uh, so finally, we have our last speaker of this talk series, and this will be done by Leah Davis. Dr. Davis is an assistant professor for genetic medicine, psychiatry, and behavioral sciences, and biomedical informatics at Vanderbilt University and Medical Center. She is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Medicine, uh, the Division of Biological Sciences at Meharry uh, Medical College. So loads. <laughs> um, and before COVID-19, uh, Dr. Davis uh, employed uh, population genetics tools uh, to study complex um, phenotypes um, and the genetic basis of those complex phenotypes. Uh, and now with COVID, uh, or excuse me, with um, those phenotypes she would use uh, biobanks that she has access to, including Vanderbilt's biobank. Um, this is an important note here because with COVID, um, she has employed those same biobanks and a collaboration across other biobanks, including at the Broad, um, to look at um, the host biology of, or the host genetics of coronavirus and the implications of coronavirus based on um, different, uh, having a different genetic basis. So uh, thank you so much, Leah. So let's give a warm welcome to her. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, my slides here. And all right, are you seeing full screen? Full screen. Perfect. Okay, so I am 
just so delighted to be here and, and really honored to be a part of such an incredible program today. So this is actually my first experience with WIDS and, um, and now I'm hooked. So I, I really hope it won't be my last. <laughs> so my plan for the next um, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so um, is to share some of our work on, um, like Megan said, the host genomics of uh, COVID-19 susceptibility and severity. Um, although, you know, a, a bit of a spoiler alert, like these are very early days still in that analysis. So there's not a lot of results really to, um, to share with you yet. Um, and so I also, in keeping with the spirit of um, the, the WIDS organization, wanted to share with you how it happened that I have been able to contribute to this effort. Um, and my hope is that kind of, um, you know, as I tell you more about my own journey uh, to data science, um, that that might resonate with you and, and your journey as well. So I thought it would kind of first make the most sense to introduce you um, a little bit to um, my group. Um, I think I'm the only uh, non-Brody uh, who's presenting today. So, um, so this is uh, my lab at Vanderbilt. And actually, since, um, since this photo was taken, this was our holiday party last year. We've grown by two more grad students. Um, and so our lab is completely computational, completely dry lab. Um, and we are here on the fifth floor of Light Hall um, on the Vanderbilt Medical Campus. So we're also part of the Vanderbilt um, Genetics Institute, which is a interdisciplinary um, center with faculty, students, and staff from all over um, the university who study the genome. Um, and we're part of the Vanderbilt Data Science Institute. Um, and so really one of the most exciting things about being at Vanderbilt and one of the things, the main things that attracted me to, um, to the university um, is that we have access to this very large electronic medical record um, and a linked biobank. And this has ended up being a central focus of um, a lot of the work that we're doing in the lab. Um, so this is a schematic of the Vanderbilt um, EHR and it demonstrates um, a number of the data types that are uh, available for research to us. Um, so that includes things like you know, clinical notes, medications, labs, um, billing codes, which we use um, often as proxies for uh, disease diagnoses, um, and um, as well as the, the actual um, uh, clinical notes that are inputted by you know, a, a nurse or a physician. And so this is, um, the kind of information that we would apply methods like natural language processing and pattern recognition to, to try to extract meaningful um, phenotypic information. Um, and then on a subset of these individuals, so um, we have, I have here in green, uh, sorry, in gray that this uh, data gets pushed into a de-identified um, space. And on a subset of those de-identified individuals, we also have genotype information um, and, and DNA collected. Uh, and so that's what we refer to as BioView. So that's our biobank sample. Um, and so we've been using electronic health records to better understand the relationship between, um, uh, as Megan said, um, complex chronic disease um, and primarily between neuropsychiatric disorders and complex chronic disease. Um, and it turns out that this is a really understudied area of research, um, kind of in part because of the historical separation between psychiatry and neurology and the rest of medicine. Um, and even today, you can see evidence of this in you know, a lot of hospitals and med schools, that there's a department of medicine and a separate department of psychiatry. Um, and so the medical research on mental health um, often ignores the fact that um, the brain is not functioning in isolation and, of course, is a part of a much greater system um, and it both affects and is affected by that system. Um, and this is also coming into play now as we're starting to discover more and more of the neurological consequences of COVID infection as well. Um, and so I, I don't know if many of you remember Emo Phillips. So he was a comedian from the 90s. He was a regular on Dr. Katz, which is what this little screenshot is taken from. Um, and he had this joke. Uh, he said that, um, I used to think that the brain was the most wonderful organ in my body. 
And then I realized who was telling me this. And I mean, it's corny and cheeky, but, um, but I think it, it always makes me chuckle because um, it reminds me that frequently in um, human genetics in particular, we approach um, the study of a particular phenotype with a very myopic view. Um, and the notion that, you know, we're going to study the genetics of this one thing and everything else that's going on doesn't really matter. Um, and so doing work in the context of the electronic health record where you have this naturalistic collection of data, um, both in terms of phenotype and in terms of, you know, quantitative traits and, and often in terms of socioeconomic changes that are happening um, with an individual, you start to see how truly interconnected all of these things are. And I think this is, again, starting to um, come to the fore in some of our um, evaluations of data around COVID. So understanding the fact that there are um, massive health disparities that are being highlighted by uh, COVID infection and the response to COVID infection and severity. Um, and so, but for me personally, um, and my story in terms of moving from kind of bench biology into um, data science, this was very true of, of my, um, my outlook as well. So in the very beginning, I was very, very myopically focused specifically on autism genetics. Um, so this is a picture of um, my stepson, Dylan, and he's holding his baby sister, Bridget. So Bridget was born when I was in graduate school. Um, and, uh, and Dylan was really the reason that I got into uh, human genetics. So this picture was really a momentous um, occasion in our house. It was the first time that Dylan ever held Bridget. And, um, and part of the reason for that is that he um, has autism. He has significant cognitive impairment. He's nonverbal. Um, and it took him a while to develop, well, him and us, a while to develop the confidence to hold his baby sister. Um, but you can see, you know, from the photo, like how excited he was about this. So uh, the reason that I bring this up is because um, I, I think, you know, for me personally, a big part of the reason that I got into science to begin with was that um, I wanted to help people. Um, I wanted to help families like ours. I wanted to help kids like Dylan. Um, I wanted to understand what was going on at a biological level um, and, uh, and use that information to improve quality of life. Um, and actually one of my very first projects in the lab um, was focused on the analysis of um, a deletion region that um, we identified in fact in Dillon. Um, and so this was kind of a, a very unusual um, experience where, you know, my, my goal was to help kids like Dylan and we actually ended up being able to help Dylan, which I think it was, a, you know, unusual but incredibly rewarding. Um, and so what we discovered was that there was a, a small deletion region um, just right outside of a gene called PAX6, which is a master regulatory um, uh, transcription factor um, that turns on and off genes in the brain and in the eye. Um, and in, despite the fact that this gene itself was actually untouched, regions around the gene um, also are involved in regulating the expression of that gene. So what we saw in Dylan was that he had a deletion in um, an enhancer region of that gene. So a gene, a, a region that actually is responsible for the regulation of the expression of this gene. And as it turned out, um, Dylan was not the only uh, kid with autism and aniridia who had this, uh, this type of um, deletion. And um, this has actually given rise to a lot of additional research um, that's continuing now even on um, the role of PAX6 in brain development and its impact on autism spectrum disorders. So this was um, an incredibly rewarding um, you know, project to, to lead and, um, and really the, you know, the crux of why I got involved in science and, um, and human genetics to begin with. And it so happened that down the hall, there was also a lab that was studying um, 
age-related disorders of blindness. And we realized that the tools that I had applied in this one case could actually be, you know, um, employed across many hundreds of samples of, you know, from individuals who had AMD or um, primary open angle glaucoma um, to try to identify similar types of variations um, that could be leading to their uh, eye conditions. And this was actually, I mean, this was not that long ago, but it's kind of amazing how the, the, the change in scale, the, the sample size for these two studies um, was about 900 individuals. So by today's standards, that is not considered large. Um, for me as a graduate student back then, um, I was going from you know, working on small family-based studies to working with 900 individuals and that was an incredible jump. Um, and it really was the first time that I started to realize that with more data, I had more power and a greater ability to um, observe you know, true patterns um, and patterns that might be important in terms of the biology of the conditions that I was interested in. So it was kind of at the end of graduate school that I started to have this like, life crisis of, you know, well, could I, could I be a data scientist? <laughs> I mean, this, this had not really occurred to me, um, despite the fact that I was a scientist and I was indeed analyzing data. <laughs> so, you know, depending on your definition of a data scientist, um, but as a, as a, a change in my um, trajectory from, you know, kind of the bench side of things to, um, to working with really big data. Um, that really happened um, in my postdoctoral uh, training. And, and so I moved to the University of Chicago where um, I started working with Dr. Nancy Cox, who um, is really a world leader in um, computational and statistical approaches to very large um, population level genetic epidemiology questions. Um, and so this really kind of opened up a whole new world to me of um, better, you know, trying to apply these um, data science approaches to better understanding the genetic architecture of complex traits. Um, and, and so the projects that I took on there also, you know, forced me to sort of expand my view of um, what kinds of phenotypes I was interested in. So I had started with this very, like I said, myopic view of um, my interest in autism that then expanded to a larger view of interests in a number of neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, and then even further to endocrine phenotypes and now work in my lab studies, you know, we, we, we work on the entire medical phenome essentially. Um, and so in addition to that, um, that kind of expansion of the phenotypic side, I also was expanding my interests in the um, kind of spectrum of um, human genetic variation that is associated with disease so, or with uh, complex traits. So here's an example of this relationship where we can see that you know, very, very rare variants um, are frequently those that are involved in um, Mendelian conditions uh, with a very large effect size. But very, very common variants um, are often, you know, often have much smaller effect sizes um, and are often involved in increasing the susceptibility to common disease or common variation. Um, and the way that we kind of think about this is that, you know, we all have some underlying genetic liability to basically every complex trait that exists, whether that is susceptibility for COVID or autism or, you know, cardiovascular disease, we all carry some genetic liability to that. Um, and, and that there is a, an accumulation of risk factors, some genetic, some non-genetic, that might push us over a threshold to which we eventually get a diagnosis. So these were the kinds of approaches that we applied to, um, to other 
phenotypes. Like I said, uh, Tourette syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder were the ones that I primarily worked on um, as a postdoc. Um, and some of the work that I did there was showing that you know, these conditions were in fact highly polygenic. Hundreds of, or thousands of variants contributing to susceptibility and that they were genetically correlated, um, which was something that had been hypothesized but had not yet been shown. And so what you're seeing here um, is actually the relationship between the heritability that is captured on each chromosome and the size of that chromosome. So the fact that these disorders are both really highly polygenic allows us to test some hypotheses. So we would imagine that if something is very polygenic, then the, you know, genetic variation that contributes to susceptibility is spread across the entire genome and not concentrated within you know, one locus, for example. And if it's spread across the entire genome, then chromosomes that are larger should carry more of the genetic liability than chromosomes that are smaller. And so we see this correlation between chromosome length, for example, and heritability or the proportion of variance that's explained by each chromosome. So this, again, was, um, was an incredibly empowering, um, exciting project for me intellectually because I had access to now, you know, tens of thousands of samples. Um, and, you know, this was a, a order of magnitude greater than I had worked on in the past. Um, and it was really starting to feel like, you know, true data science. Um, but I, I have to admit that I also struggled with this because my initial interest um, and my hope was to get involved in science for the purpose of, um, of helping people. And I felt like even though what I was doing was very rewarding and very interesting, and I was you know, intoxicated by the curiosity and the ability to see real patterns in data, um, there was an element that that felt a little bit selfish. Like, you know, how is this really ever going to help anybody? And people would ask me that and I didn't really have a great answer for them. And in retrospect, I realize that um, it is actually one of the most noble reasons to get involved in a scientific endeavor uh, is just pure curiosity. And we really can't ever know actually how, um, how our work eventually might help people. Um, that is actually part of the beauty of science. Um, and, and I think once I realized that it was a completely acceptable reason to be engaged in this career out of pure curiosity and passion for discovery of what makes us human and what, you know, causes us to, you know, be more or less susceptible to disease. Um, I also realized that I could help people by just helping people, right? By um, engaging in mentoring, by being a good friend and trying to be a good neighbor, a good scientific citizen, you know, a, a, a good partner. And I realized that I knew a lot of people in the field who, um, who had gotten engaged in human genetics and um, with the idea that they wanted to help people, but they also never really seemed to want to help anybody that they actually knew. <laughs> and so I realized that, um, that I could kind of do the opposite, right? That I could continue my science out of pure curiosity and maybe not knowing exactly how it was going to um, to manifest in, you know, some benefit to society, but with the hopes that it would, and that I could continue to just help people by helping people. Um, and so then uh, my move to Vanderbilt and work began in the electronic health record. And so I think this is really when kind of the data science, um, like when I felt the, the full identity of <laughs> data science. Um, so to give you a little bit more information about um, BioView and, and our, um, our sample there. So these are some descriptive statistics. Um, we 
again, we're located in Nashville. So our main site is in Nashville, but we have a pretty large catchment area. So we actually have satellite clinics in Mississippi, Kentucky, Virginia, um, kind of all over. And so information from the um, outpatient clinics in those areas gets fed into the, to the um, electronic health record. And then, like I said, we have about um, almost 300,000 uh, individuals with DNA samples um, and about 100,000 of those who have now been genotyped. So in terms of the numbers, we have um, a little over 3 million individuals in the electronic health record, um, about 300,000 with DNA and, and over 100,000 who are now genotyped. Um, and so what this really has enabled us to do is, um, is to employ phenome-wide analysis approaches. So here's an example um, of a result from a recent paper um, that employed this kind of phenome-wide analysis approach. Um, so what you're looking at here is every dot represents the result from an analysis where we tested whether the genetic score for schizophrenia, and again, remember, we all have some genetic liability to schizophrenia. So this analysis actually includes about 100,000 people. So each dot represents a test between the genetic score for, for schizophrenia and, um, and a case control phenotype um, of about 1,800 different phenotypes that were tested. Um, and so you can see that we, you know, as expected, we see an association with schizophrenia, which is, you know, kind of our positive control here. Um, but we also see that the genetic risk for schizophrenia, in fact, even in the absence of a diagnosis of schizophrenia, is associated with a lot of other things in the medical record. So a lot of other um, psychiatric phenotypes, um, it's actually associated with some um, endocrine and metabolic phenotypes, um, as well as uh, some infectious disease. Um, and so this was really um, a method that is uniquely suited for electronic health record data. And I would also like to throw out was, um, was really developed um, by a an incredible data scientist who also happens to be a woman um, at Vanderbilt. Um, and so these kinds of methods um, have allowed us to look at not only the genetic underpinnings of disease, but also how that relates to everything else that happens um, during our lifespan in terms of our um, you know, accumulation of different phenotypes. So we were kind of trucking along, looking at um, you know, the genetic relationship between uh, you know, neuropsychiatric disorders and chronic complex disease, and then came 2020. Um, and, and this was a really, um, uh, you know, obviously a, a, has been a traumatic year for everybody. Um, in Nashville, it was um, the COVID, so COVID came to Nashville um, about two weeks after a major tornado came through and, um, and destroyed pretty large parts of the city. So by the time this happened, we were already kind of crisis fatigued. Um, and it took a little while before we realized that, um, that we could harness the skills that we had in human genetics, in electronic health record phenotype building, and our um, altruistic desire to, um, to meet crisis with, um, with a helping hand. I think really everybody wanted desperately to help in some way. Um, and so it was just a matter of days after, you know, COVID really kind of blew up in the US that, um, folks at the Broad and, um, and people at Vanderbilt and actually at um, you know, academic centers all over the world who were working on human genetics immediately started to communicate with each other and say, hey, wh what can we do to start looking at the host genetic response to COVID severity and COVID susceptibility? And so the COVID-19 uh, host genomics initiative was kind of born out of that. 
Um, and so you can see, you know, there are a number of sites all across the world now that are, um, that are involved in this. Um, and really the, the initiative, you know, I, I would echo what others have said so far is that the initiative um, has moved so rapidly and people have shared data so willingly and, um, and the, the collaboration has, um, has just kind of immediately sprung up as a, a very strong team effort. And I don't think that would have happened had we not had this history of um, building on data science and, um, and kind of open data sharing um, that has been definitely, you know, a, a, a mantra in the human genetics community. And I think also in other, um, you know, other scientific communities as well. Um, so working collaboratively on, um, on these kind of large scale human genetic studies over the last uh, decade really, you know, primed the field to be able to do this. Um, but the other thing that was an essential ingredient to acting quickly was being able to um, pull information from the electronic health record um, in the form of ICD codes, viral panels, um, and to develop a, a, an approach for actual phenotyping. So basically taking the results that, um, that Marissa you know, was feeding back to, um, you know, to the hospitals and then pulling that in um, to looking at how those results were interacting with the host genome. Um, so I was lucky enough to be a part of a, um, a group in this larger consortium that developed um, a phenotyping approach uh, for doing this. And, you know, like others, uh, we were doing this remotely. Um, so by Zoom, by Google Docs, by Slack, um, and we were iterating to, um, to phenotypes that we felt could be um, kind of our, our best, you know, bet at identifying um, both severity phenotypes and susceptibility phenotypes. And so I won't really go into this here just to give you kind of a flavor for the fact that um, we had multiple analyses that, or have multiple analyses that are planned. Um, there are a lot of different ways of looking at um, both severity and susceptibility, um, different ways of uh, subsetting individuals in terms of, you know, both case definitions, but also control definitions. Um, so looking at you know, hospitalized versus non-hospitalized patients um, and all the way up to looking at individuals you know, who have a diagnosis of COVID-19 compared to everybody else. Um, so these are some of our very early results from this consortium. So this is a genome-wide association study of um, COVID susceptibility. So here we're looking at individuals who are um, SARS-CoV-2 positive compared to everybody else, um, which has a lot of uh, you know, potential misclassification among the controls. It's definitely possible and likely, in fact, that there are some people who have been exposed in our controls. Um, and, and again, as a, um, you know, one of the things that, that we're kind of working towards as a community is, um, is trying to, you know, develop these different analytic strategies to overcome some of those challenges. Um, but so what we have here is, again, you know, similar to what I showed you in the FIWAS plot for every dot, this is a result of an analysis, um, looking at the single nucleotide polymorphism and whether an allele is more common among um, individuals who tested positive versus anybody else. Um, and so these are organized across, um, you know, kind of in physical space um, across the chromosomes on the x-axis and then on the y-axis is the minus log 10 of the p-value. So um, what we're seeing here is that nothing so far is reaching uh, genome-wide significance. So the surpassing the correction for the fact that we've done, you know, millions of tests here. Um, but what, this is still at a pretty small sample size. And so we would actually expect that this is probably what we would see at this level. But really this is, um, 
you know, just seeing this come together is a proof of principle that the community can work together, that we can share data, that we can meta-analyze, that we can get reasonable results, and that we can do it pretty quickly. So this, again, you know, like others, happened within the span of about two weeks. Um, I will just wrap up by saying that um, within my group, we have also been working on a uh, what we're calling an all-cause acute respiratory distress syndrome analysis. So this is looking at um, uh, the, the acute respiratory distress that is um, primarily responsible for the fatalities in COVID, but can also occur in the context of other um, viral disease or even in sepsis. Um, and because we have this electronic health record and um, a large amount of genetic data, we can actually look at um, whether we can look at the acute respiratory distress in these other viral um, infections and ask, you know, when we compare that against um, ARDS in the context of COVID, do we see anything that is unique to COVID that could help us to hone in on, um, you know, particularly responsive treatments for COVID? So this is a, another uh, phenome-wide association study of our acute respiratory distress syndrome um, analysis. And this is just within our own biobank. Um, lastly, I wanted to show you um, also a, a similar kind of approach, not quite um, a FIWAS, this is called a LabWAS. This plot actually took three years to develop um, and it's because the, the the data um, that gets submitted to, you know, from um, clinical lab testing into the electronic health record, it turns out is incredibly messy. And so um, this was a huge effort that my group had been involved in, you know, for years up until now um, to just clean this data and make it, you know, analysis ready to develop pipelines and tools. Um, and we now have over 900 labs that we've cleaned um, which represents about 168 million data points. Um, and so being able to look very quickly at what labs are indicated in, um, uh, in ARDS in the context, again, of regular viral infection versus COVID infection, um, we're hoping can give us some indicators as to you know, what are some important biomarkers that we might need to be looking at in COVID. So I think the very last thing I would say is, um, you know, when I was considering the shift from um, bench science to um, to data science, I, my brother was actually one of the one, kind of my biggest supporters, and he told me, you know, I was telling him, well, I'm just very intimidated. You know, there are not very many women in the field, and and he said, Leah, just storm the gates and leave them open, and um, I think that was great advice. <laughs> and so that's the advice that I would. Um, pass on to anybody who's kind of considering, you know, getting involved in this because you really never know when you will have the right tools at the right time to make a surprising impact. So, um, you know, allow your curiosity to take you in new directions. Don't forget to help people by helping people. And, um, and I would say that, you know, data science is the tool, but it's, it's really up to you to show up. I, I think I may have gone over time a little bit, but thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, we did have a little extra time to spare, so I didn't stop you. That was me. <laughs> um, thank you so much. This was so interesting. Um, it's very cool to see how your your study of complex uh, diseases and phenotypes can kind of just naturally lead in, um, and it kind of shows how adaptable data sciences and how adaptable statistics is. Uh, so it's a really great story of that as well.